Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Turing Scheme webinar for schools today. I um, hope you're all keeping well. Um, and we know you're busy, so we won't take up too much of your, your time today. Um, I just want to note before we start, the webinar will be recorded and we will be sharing a recording with you afterwards alongside some supporting resources. Um, so if we move on to the first slide, I'll just take you through um, who's speaking today. Um, so a little bit back to forward. So my name is Kira McCoy. Apologies off camera today. Um, my my internet isn't great and I also don't look the best with the cold today. Um, but I am the, the marketing lead from Capita for the pro our programmes and contracts, which includes the Turing Scheme. We're also joined today by Martin Conliffe from the comms and stakeholder engagement team in the Department for Education, and Myrna McDonald from Bella Houston Academy, Glasgow, who is going to give you an overview of their participation in the Turing Scheme. Um, so the agenda today, so again, Martin is going to give an introduction to the Turing Scheme. Uh, we'll then move on to myself to go through some of the funding opportunities for the school sector. We'll then hear from Bell Houston Academy and we'll finish off with some information around how do you apply and Q&A session. Um, can we ask if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat as we move along. We, we will answer if we can um, and any questions we can't answer, we will respond to following the webinar. Um, so at this stage, I will pass you over to to Martin to give an introduction to the Turing Scheme. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Kira. Hello, everyone. My name's Martin Cunliffe and I work for the Department for Education on the Communications and Stakeholder Engagement Team for the Turing Scheme. I'll start by thanking you for attending this webinar and I'll just speak briefly to provide you with a bit of the policy context as we start on what is going to be the third year of the Turing Scheme, which is going to support placements that will take place in the 2023 to 24 academic year. Now, some of you may already have experience of the scheme from previous years, and for others, this will be your first time planning an application. But in either case, today's webinar will help you to better understand how the scheme operates, give you the chance to hear some of the amazing stories from Bell Houston Academy, who've already been making use of the funding, and help you to develop the best possible application so that your pupils can take advantage of the opportunities the Turing Scheme offers. There are no major changes to the scope or operation of the Turing Scheme this year. Uh, we have, however, clarified some of the eligibility criteria to ensure that the programme guide is as clear as possible. And a list of those changes can be found on page seven of the programme guide. Um, as DFE, our key call to you is basically to ask that you take advantage of the opportunities offered by the scheme and the support offered by Capita as you prepare your applications, define your projects. Uh, we've published everything that you need to prepare your applications. That's all available to you now through the Turing Scheme website, where you can find the, the programme guide, the application guide, and a specific guide for schools that CAPTA have produced. All of these are on the funding opportunities page for schools under application support. That's all I have to say for now, but I really look forward to seeing your projects develop and get delivered. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, so move on to the next section. Um, I'm going to take you through some information on the funding available for schools. Um, so to begin with, every school in Scotland from primary right through to secondary level is eligible to apply for the funding um, as part of the Turing Scheme. Um, it is one application per school and it's a really good opportunity for you to offer your students the, the opportunity to travel abroad and experience new cultures. Um, and also for your staff to find out more new learning practices. Um, Capita's role as part of the Turing Scheme is to promote and also administer the grant funding. Um, and this is our second year in doing so, and we're really delighted to be part of the Turing Scheme. Um, and you'll hear from Bell Houston Academy today some of the amazing outcomes which they have achieved as part of the scheme. Um, and again, as Echoey Martin, we'd really encourage you to, to apply for it. It's an excellent opportunity for your students. Um, in terms of school placements, um, there's funding available for at, at different levels. So you see there's two elements. There's short-term placements, which is everything anything from three days to two months. Uh, the one thing to note is these are mostly classroom-based and you will need a partner organisation, such as another school in the country you're travelling to. 
There are longer term placements available from two to six months, but participants for these placements must be over 14 years old. Um, so that is where the, the student, a student or a group of students would, would spend time with a host company or a host family um, and really be absorbed in that learning experience and learning culture anywhere in the world. There is additional support and funding available for participant, participants from a disadvantaged background. Um, this additional funding can help with anything from visas to passport application costs, even health insurance and, and such things such as luggage. Because the Turing scheme um, at its core is about widening participation and making these opportunities available for everyone. And we want to make it as um, accessible as possible. And there are a lot of your people out there who may not have a passport um, and may come from a background that, that can buy luggage and, and pay for all these additional things. So it's a really good opportunity for that. There's also funding available for SEND participants where 100% of the actual cost for their daily support um, relating to their additional needs is covered as part of this. And this is also um, prep visits um, to help with risk assessments uh, for a maximum of um, three days as well. All the funding guidelines and information that you, if you get for each of those is available in the programme guide. Um, which will help you calculate out how much that, that would be. But it's really it's really good opportunity to um, look at that funding and see what would be available to you. And if we move on to the next slide, a little bit more information on that here for you. So um, as you can see, so pupils and accompanying staff um, of either of those school placements, either short term or longer term, um, will receive a payment of £53 per day for the first 14 days and 37 afterwards. Um, and that amount of funding goes directly towards direct costs such as travel for the placement. There's also, you know, the participants that are defined from a disadvantaged background. It's all laid out again in the programme guide. You'll probably hear me saying a lot to, to refer to that. But again, that covers all your additional travel costs. Um, and then a little bit more information about the, those participants from Ascend, um, Ascend allocation. Um, and that's 100% funding towards those direct needs. Um, and as you can see, as I mentioned, all laid out in the program guide as well. So we move on to the next slide. It's a little bit more just information about why schools should apply. Um, and, and there's so many benefits in all our case studies and our other video case studies. Any school that participates is really passionate about the outcomes of that. Um, it really is a life changing experience for young people. So what, what we hear from from schools who participate is that their students are experiencing new cultures, they're learning new skills, um, they're, they're taking them out from their, their day to day environment and, and exposing them to an, a whole new world for them. But what they see when they come back is the confidence levels rising, um, which, which is amazing to see in such young people. It also helps with the funding of existing school trips. So there, there are lots of aspirational trips which you may want to go on with your students, but the funding just isn't available for parental contributions. But looking at it from the Turing scheme participation um, and having that educational element, it is the ideal scheme to apply for funding for to support those. Um, it also helps your staff. So by being absorbed, not only in a new culture, but a new teaching culture, you can hit find out about new practices and new approaches and that just experience working in that informal environment can be really beneficial to to your staff as well and it also builds in relationships so one element and we touched on it later in the presentation is around finding your international partner um, but if you already have that connection or if it's a new established connection it really does um, enhance that and, and, build, and build on your your global relationships as well as your relationship between teachers and students and, and working together in the form of the visit that really increases learning motivation um, and that collaboration between teachers and students. Um, and if we're moving on, um, I'm now going to pass you over to Myrna McDonald from Bell Houston Academy, um, who has joined us today to share with you the, their experience of the, the Turing scheme. So pass over to you, Myrna. Thank you. OK, that's my camera on. Um, thank you for inviting me to this. Um, I think I'd really like to start off by saying the Turing scheme enabled me to run a, a school mobility 
to uh, for children um, who wouldn't otherwise be able to go really anywhere. Um, some of the children that came with us in May last year to Reykjavik had never been outside Glasgow before. And so to me, especially as a teacher in inner city Glasgow, um, the fact that the Turing Scheme offers additional funds for children with things like, for example, free school meals, and there, there's a whole load of different criteria. But the fact that the 14 children that I took were all free school meal eligible pupils um, was wonderful because these sort of children tend to be the children that don't even take uh, forms home because they know fine what the answer is going to be if a school trip's costing hundreds of pounds. So um, the Turing scheme um, enabled me to run a trip to Iceland for a week. Uh, I chose Iceland because at that time of the application, Iceland had very limited um, regulations to do with COVID, um, which was obviously a concern at that time. Um, we had a link with a school in Iceland through Glasgow City Council. Many of the councils in Scotland will already have a link or people within countries who will be able to get you all in contact with a school that you can work with. Um, again, it enabled some of our children uh, to pay for passport photos. The passports, some of them didn't have luggage. Some of them, for example, didn't have a jacket. Uh, it enabled us to uh, when we were in Iceland, go with the Icelandic pupils on a visit to see geysers and waterfalls and tomato farms in the Arctic Circle, which was quite incredible. Um, and basically, the children had a mad experience, um, which I think is really important in the lives of children, something that was totally out of the ordinary for them, something that will stay with them for the rest of their lives. We based the work that we did with the school in Iceland alongside the John Muir Award, um, so the children from Scotland got the John Muir Award while they were in Iceland, as did the Icelandic children. And I think it's quite useful to have something like the John Muir Award, which is free to all schools, because it gives you a kind of anchor uh, for the, the whole trip. We tried to tie it in with COP26, which of course had been held in Glasgow. So I think you should all have a good look at um, the Turing scheme. There isn't that much time to apply um, for funding, but I think that the people in Turing, we had quite a lot of help to and from uh, Turing. We had a lot of help from the council and I'm willing to help anyone who is who is running trips free to, um, to children who need something like that in their lives. So thank you very much for inviting me along. Thank you. Thank you, Myrtle. Uh, so, so refreshing to hear how passionate um, your school has been about Turing. And any questions for Myrtle, please put in the chat and we can address afterwards. Um, so we're going to share with you now some information around how to apply for the Turing Scheme. Um, so the application is completely online. Um, we do have a slide later on on the timeline, but applications open officially on the 14th of February and they close on the 6th of April. So four weeks tomorrow until the until they close. Um, but there is a full application guide on the Turing Scheme website, and we'll also share the link with you afterwards, which takes you through step-by-step -step guide of the form, with also some hints and tips. Um, there's four sections as such, which we which are listed on the um, right-hand side of the screen, uh, from international engagement right through design and implementation, with a series of questions within each section, each of a, a, a maximum score between 20 and 30. Some of the questions are narrative with a 500 word limited limit on those. Um, but again, further guidance on what should be written in each and some tips from feedback from previous year. It's all within the application guide. Um, we'll also hope to have an application guide video coming soon. Once the application is submitted, um, they are then passed to our partner, the Association of Commonwealth Universities, who does an independent assessment of the application form. Um, and scores, etc. Um, and that that is uh, thoroughly checked and gone through uh, according to the scoring criteria. Um, again, application guide is definitely your best resource to look at this. Um, we have some hints and tips as well for your application. One of the things is um, 
to, to prepare as much as possible and, and speak to your staff, etc., um, to cross reference between um, different answers rather than, than repeating yourself. And also just be really clear on your, your disadvantaged students um, and all that criteria is all within the programme guide as well around eligibility and information on that. So if we move to the next slide, please. Um, we just wanted to highlight some information around finding an international partner. We know from feedback that this can be quite difficult sometimes um, if you don't already have international established um, links. Um, we have a blog online with some hints and tips on how to do this um, because it, it needs to be a, a so if you're traveling to a country such as um, Spain, it will need to be a school or an education establishment in that country. Um, but um, as Myrtle really spoke about, he went to the, the Glasgow Council. That's a, a really good um, option if you're trying to find an international partner and don't have one. So speak to your local authorities, speak to your local councils, speak to your universities. Um, look at any previous relationships you may have had with international organisations which possibly have fallen to the wayside. Um, and also I would look at our previous case studies. You'll start to see where um, other organisations have established those partnerships with and where you may be able to go to. But again, there, there's lots of resources out there to, to help with as well. <clears throat> and if we move on to the next slide, this is where we touch base on some of the top tips for a successful application. Um, we have a range of resources and I know we've mentioned those a couple of times now. Um, but the programme guide really is like your, your Bible for the Turing scheme. It has all the information you need to know um, right through from eligibility through eligibility criteria through to all those all the funding information um it really is a really good place to check what we also have available is a schools guide uh, for the Turing scheme which pulls out some of that information um, some of that key information and it's quite good as a, as a first glance and then refer back to the program guide um, we also have the application guide, as I mentioned, which is really good, and our FAQ section on the website. Um, if you can't find the answers you need to in any of those, we do have the a service centre as well who you can email. Um, and this feedback comes from the, the Association, Education, Association of Commonwealth Universities and also some of the, the previous applicants. One of the um, hints and tips that we were given was know your priorities. So look at the scoring. Um, criteria and application guide and focus more so on where those uh, quality criteria and, and where those are. Sorry, Kira, we seem to be missing your voice at the moment. I don't know if that's your poor internet connection. Looks like we might have lost Kira. I mean, it sounds as if she's struggling with her voice anyway. I can pick up if uh, we will hope maybe she, she rejoins at some stage if she can. Uh, my, for those who don't know, my name is Lee Gibson. I work with Kira on uh, marketing and communications for the touring scheme at Capita. I think she was talking about there. Uh, top tip number two, knowing your priorities and, uh, and obviously ensuring that your your school objectives and priorities and the aims that you that you're looking for from your project sort of align with those um, wider scheme objectives that we saw earlier, um, so that you you know you can maximise your scoring when it comes to the the assessment of your application through the qualitative criteria. Um, I think three four. Five and six are probably quite pretty much common sense, really. But obviously, it's it's always a good idea to plan ahead, um, start your collaboration early, figure out who who needs to be involved in the application process, colleagues internally, partners externally, gather all of your information together, make sure everything is in order as much as you can before you you start your application, and then once you you start your application, obviously to to work through the the, the form logically. Um, organize your content um, and work it work smartly in terms of uh, where the same information is relevant in, in maybe in more than one section of the application so you don't you know don't waste time 
cutting and pasting, filling the using the same information twice, cross referenced to the previous mention of that of that information. Um, makes more sense than, than filling it in again. And obviously to where there are words, word counts in play, it will also help you with that as well. And finally, and, and obviously quite importantly, make sure that uh, you check and double check everything before before you press the final button and then make a note of your your application ID for, for future reference as well. Also, we can we can only accept applications once applications can't be resubmitted. So it's, it's literally as soon as you've press that button, that is what will be assessed. So do everything you can to make sure that it is in the best order as it can it can be before you submit it. Can we move on to the next slide, Rich? Yeah, just a quick reminder again of the timelines. Obviously, as Kira mentioned earlier, the, the application window is now open, been open since Valentine's Day. Um, and the deadline for applications is the 6th of April. Um, I think it's probably worth noting that the deadline on the 6th of April is 4 p.m., not not 11, 8, 11 p.m. as those of you who were maybe involved in Erasmus Plus previously might recall or midnight at the 4 p.m. So again, worth bearing that in mind when you, you are planning the timelines and, and your application, make sure it's in by that 4 p.m. deadline. I mean, if possible, ensure you get it in earlier than that. I mean, I, invariably, there will be a last minute rush on the 6th of April, so it's always better if possible if you can get it submit earlier just in case there are any final technical problems or issues and then obviously once applications are submitted and we've assessed them or the association of commonwealth university have assessed them as kira said we will look to be notifying people of the outcomes by the summer this year so move on rich okay again as kira said we have mentioned these quite a number of times now, but it's worth pressing the point home that there are a number of resources available to help you um, work your way through the application process and submit your application. We've mentioned the program guide multiple times and it really is the the essential go to document for anyone who's intended to apply, as, as Kira said, because it has all of the information uh, um, relating to eligibility, relating to the application process, detailed information about how you will be your applications will be assessed and the funding available, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the application guide, again, we've mentioned several times, that's uh, obviously designed to support and, and walk you through the uh, the application itself. And there is in, included in there a step-by-step -step guide um, of, uh, of how to fill in the application form. Um, and as, again, as Kira mentioned earlier, we should in the next few days also have available a, a video tutorial that also takes you through the application uh, form. Our promotional guide for schools, again, we've also mentioned earlier quickly, that's available. Um, a bit more of a, as the name would suggest, a promotional document than the two previous documents, which are obviously heavily focused on support. This, this is, will have information, again, about what schools can do with the scheme, and there is more more content from previous beneficiaries and schools that have already used the funding, which you, you know, hopefully will, in, will inspire you to, to make your own application too. Kira has already mentioned FAQs on the website as well. They're a resource and also a number of blogs designed to either guide you through the application process or inspire your applications, many focused on, on schools. And then obviously, again, we've already mentioned our case studies um, featuring the stories of of organisations who've already successfully applied for funding and what they did with it and, and, and how they felt it's benefited the, their organisations and their their participants. Um, and again, several of those uh, do relate to schools, including the one on Villa Houston Academy, which which I shared a link for in the chat earlier. Um, so next steps, I mean, it's what it says next steps, probably preparation, prepare, that's, we should probably already be well into that phase really if you, uh, if you're not, um, but obviously by, by the way of preparation, again, make sure you take time to make use of and read all of those um, resources available to support and guide you if you if you need to. Again, as Kira mentioned, contact our service centre. Uh, as we mentioned previously, you know, planning planning is key. Make sure you you plan as thoroughly as you can as for as far as far in advance as you can. Um, 
act now. I mean, if you if you haven't done already now, is certainly the time to register on the application portal, create your account, which will give you access to the the online application form, so you can see firsthand what's required um, and start filling filling that in. And you can you can fill that in over several sessions. And that doesn't have to be done in one sitting. You can start filling in the form, come back to it later. Um, and gradually build your application, working towards, again, as I said earlier, making sure that everything is in good order um, for submission ahead of that final deadline on um, April the 6th. Next slide, Rich. OK, well, that, that is it from us to you today. Um, all that remains is to uh, I think thank again everyone who's taken part. So thank you to Martin from DFE and to Murdo from Bella Houston Academy for for attending and contributing. Um, we have got some time to take some questions. If there are questions, um, we will do our best to answer them. And as we've said previously, if we can't answer them today, we'll take them away and consult our operational technical colleagues if that's the nature of the questions to see if we can get answers to you subsequently either either directly or via our communications channels or adding them to the FAQs that were mentioned earlier etc cetera, etc cetera. so I don't know whether there are any questions specifically for us I see with several for Murdo which he's done which he's already answering in, in the chat feverishly yeah we can see there's uh, one person typing currently uh, but I think that's the only uh, the only question coming through at the moment. I, would, uh, I was just going to come in and pick up on a couple of the points kind of more generally in the chat and it's just it's more fundamentals but again talking about selecting pupils talking about how big a project now obviously the Turing scheme is very scalable you could be sending one group to one destination or multiple groups to multiple destinations there's no right size your project needs to be the size it is to support the pupils that you can send abroad with the accompanying adults etc in order to deliver the outcomes that you're looking for so if you want to send larger numbers you can smaller numbers it's fine it's it's really wide ranging and again we're uk wide there is no split ac across the nations in terms of the funding you're it's a competitive scheme so uh, apply for the funding you require and if your applications are successful then we'll give you as much of that funding as we can and generally with the applications the one thing i'd say and some of the stuff that murdo said in the, the chat kind of really goes to this in terms of how they selected participants and stuff is be specific uh particularly understanding obviously we will receive applications from schools across the UK and British overseas territories. We don't necessarily know all of your local circumstances, so it's often really useful to explain the context in which you're operating, particularly around levelling up and understanding the level of disadvantage in your student cohort, for example, how you might be identifying and working with different student groups in order to ensure that you're widening participation, in order to ensure that you're providing them with the support that they need before, during and after. And so I think a lot of the things he's talked about there in terms of how they selected the pupils, etc. It's really good. And that's the kind of uh, detail that really can help your project work strongly so that we understand how you're going to um, enact the project and actually achieve all of those aims and objectives. Um, <clears throat> just to say there's also a question on uh, I see from Mrs. Hook on uh, how long are the projects expected to last around the visits now? Uh, obviously, uh, as we covered right at the start, you can have short term and you can have long term opportunities. A project will work across the academic year, but when you have sent your last mobilities, that will be essentially the start of the end of your project. And then there is a period where you get to do your final reporting, etc. But we provide the opportunity for you to scale it quite heavily, depending on the the applicate the the particular pupils that you're sending and how long that you're sending them for again with the scheme we provide flexibility so there is no right answer there is no correct uh kind of size or duration it's really about the activity that you are, are looking to deliver for your pupils and what's necessary to achieve that and making sure that you obviously quite often in terms of numbers, the main restriction is the accompanying adults and making sure that you've got enough teachers who can be accompanying them. That's the main thing that will limit you in groups, but otherwise it's really very much a case 
of uh, if your project's two weeks, if your project's four weeks, or all of this can be considered, etc. And then also I noticed we've got a question from uh, Joanne Scobie. Uh, preparatory visits are only funded if SEND pupils are involved in the project, yes. However, I would note if you feel preparatory visits are necessary, one of the things that the scheme provides is organisational support funding, and that is £315 per participant for the first 100 participants. And that funding is to support you in the administration of the scheme. But again, as part of that, you are entitled to use it for preparatory visits if you feel that they are appropriate and you could fund it with that amount of funding so it's not additional funding unless it's send but we do provide that administrative support in order that you can do all of the things around the edges of the project to make it happen and make yourselves comfortable in terms of the environment you're sending your pupils to if we just do a last call if there are any questions but again, as you're going through your applications as well, uh, as we say, you know, uh, Capita does have the service centre and everything. You can reach out for support if you've got any questions, if you're cautious how you might interpret a particular question or you wanted to check, you, you can uh, make sure that you're filling things right in by contacting them. OK, thanks very much and thanks, Lee. Great, thanks, Martin. Certainly a couple of questions I couldn't have dealt with off the top of my head there. Um, great. Well, so we've still got one person typing, so we'll maybe see what that is. But if there are no further questions, we can probably let you get back to what I'm sure are your very busy days. Thank you very much for your attendance once again. Good luck in with your applications. If you do, hopefully go on to apply this year. And, and thanks again to, to Martin and Murdo for, for their contributions. Thank you very much.